do we see in the Middle East? We see an implosion. The Arab world, I would say, is no more. Nobody has a crystal ball, but if I had to predict, you know, if today the Arab uh, uh, League is, consists of uh, 22 Arab countries, I would be a bit surprised. I mean, if a very short time, five years or so, we will have 30 and maybe more Arab countries. Syria is a case in point, but not only Syria. Uh, when Assad goes down, and he will go down, I, nobody knows when. It could be tomorrow, it could be in a year from now. But with all this protracted uh, uh, slaughter and, 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 and war and, and civil uh, war, uh, unfortunately, what we see is that before he goes down, he will take the entire country down. And in any case, um, the sectarian <coughs> war is already very, very evident. So uh, um, the Druze, the Kurds, the, the Sunni, the Alawites, which are type of Shiite, you know, they're already Christians, 10% of the Syrian population, about a million and a half or more are, are Christians, are already kind of bracing for uh, their own defense. And uh, we may see a, a, a major split in Syria. Uh, and again, here the sad news is that what happens in Syria does not stay only in Syria. And it spills over uh, to Lebanon, maybe even to Iraq. In Iraq, for instance, you know, you have the Kurdish area uh, which is totally autonomous from the rest, from the, the, the Shia and the Sunnis, which are still fighting in, in, uh, in, in Iraq. And the Kurdish uh, already are exporting their own oil for the first time, directly to markets overseas. Um, there are as many direct flights from Europe and elsewhere to Erbil, to the Kurdish area, than there are to Baghdad. And they don't go through Baghdad. Uh, European countries have their consulates in the Kurdish area to do, to do business. This is a, a, I think, an epitome of the change, the geopolitical change that we will see in the Middle East. Libya, for instance, until Gaddafi was gone, everybody thought of Libya as kind of a monolithic uh, entity. Now we realize Libya is made of 140 different tribes that are throw, throughout of each other. There is nothing in common between Benghazi and in the West and Tripoli in the East. And, and this goes, and every country we can point in the Middle East, we see the, the problems. And here, this is a big challenge for Israel. I would say on the upside is that the, the threat of a coalition, a, a war coalition against Israel is diminishing. Uh, but the downside is that with the lack of central control, we see the rise of radicalization, extremism, and terrorism. We already experience it in our southern border. We may experience it on our northern border with Syria. We have to remember, Assad, the father and son, under their rule, our northern border was the quietest since 1974. We may have to think of a, a, a different uh, configuration over there. So what do we do? Uh, so we have to actually plan for it. You know, We have finished our fence on the southern border with the, the Sinai. And we are now doubling up on doing the same thing in the north. And when I say fence, it's not just barbed wires. It's a very uh, smart fence with a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms uh, uh, of, of protection. Um, missile defense. You know, the Iron Dome, which is the only battle tested uh, equipment, has uh, reached a phenomenal rate of success of 85%. Now, based on the results, on the experience, we are upgrading it to the David Sling, and we have also the Arrow for the longer range incoming missiles, and I believe we can reach 95 or so percent uh, of, of success rate. Uh, this gives a lot of comfort to the population with all the risks uh, that are uh, emerging, and also giving a lot of flexibility and latitude to leaders, how you know they, they can take more margins of uh, uh, when, when they uh, deal with anything that, that, that we have to plan. Um, and also, um, I believe that this uh, Iron Dome will be very much in demand by the U.S. military. It's, it's great for, food protect, uh, for troop protection, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq or elsewhere, and for allies of Israel and the United States. Just think of South Korea uh, pro defending itself against the North, or, um, or Japan, or Eastern European countries, or many others. So, this is something that um, we are already 
claiming uh, for today. So if I look into the future with all the, uh, the threats that, that we do face, and uh, I would say the immediate threats are increased terrorism with radicalization, incitement, of course, hatred, maybe some um, forced uh, mass immigration. Uh, fortunately, they do not come knocking on our doors uh, from Syria. They are in uh, Jordan and, uh, and uh, in Lebanon. But uh, the same concerns that we have of uh, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction or, uh, or terrorism or radicalizations or mass illegal immigration is the same concerns that our European allies face, again here. So I believe uh, that uh, the coordination and pulling together our, our efforts and our assets um, of the like-minded countries will be much more important now and in the future, in the immediate future, than it was ever before, since certainly it's the most important since World War II. But if I had to, to pick the mega trends, I would say it's important to, to note two mega trends that transpire, I would say, si simultaneously, and they are in opposition in terms of direction. One, I would say, is of an economic or technological nature of integration. It used to be called in the 90s, I guess, globalization. But we, we do see unification of markets, unification of technology. Technology is really the, the hard currency of, of the world. We see how the world is so much interconnected uh, to, to the effect that if a bank in Scotland goes bankrupt, you know, the effects are in Russia or in China or here or, or anywhere and the other way around. So this is something that we have to understand is happening and we'll have to derive some conclusions from it. Um, maybe we'll get to it later. The second mega trend is of disintegration. If we see an economic and technological integration, we see political disintegration. I don't know, uh, I think it's quite amazing that in a year from now, uh, 2014, the Scots people are going to go on a referendum whether to secede from Britain. Um, the Belgians are already, the, the Ballons and the, the Flames are talking about a separation. And, and this is uh, uh, after what happened in the, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, with Czechoslovakia, with Yugoslavia breaking into the six different uh, uh, nations. And this is before talking about what's happening in the Middle East. So this is something also which we will have to live with. And uh, if the economic integration is, is good news, and I think it's very good news for Israel, because uh, uh, we live off our intellectual property, and uh, we are really a, uh, a hub of innovation, of creativity, of, uh, of technology. And technology is very important. Uh, because I believe it's the only one thing that can close the gap between a very steep uh, supply side, uh, I mean demand side. We're talking about a world of seven billion today. Soon, less than a generation, maybe nine or ten billion. What do we need? I mean, we, we're talking now about the problems in Syria, in Libya, in Chad, uh, whatever. But. If we are serious, we have to think what kind of a world we leave to our children and their children. And that means we have to think right now how to make sure that 10 billion people in the world in 2050 will have food security, water availability, affordable energy, access to, uh, to uh, good medical care, education, and what have you. And right now, if we don't have this meeting of this supply and demand side uh, uh, curves. The only thing that can close this gap is technology. Now, why do I say this is a good news? Because in Israel, I think we are at the front, the forefront, cutting edge of so many technological um, uh, developments. Agriculture, for instance. Today, agriculture is a high-tech business. And any of you who know, you know we have the Volcanic Institute, we have many startups in bioengineering, startup companies that already are producing and designing the crops of tomorrow. And tomorrow can be five years from now. Um, and, and what are these crops? Is how to produce grains or vegetables or fruits, which would be weather resistant. Uh, and, and we can do it, evidently, through this gene manipulation. 
and uh, weather resistant, that means that uh, a farmer will not be uh, dependent on the vagaries of, of, the, of the weather, uh, certainly with all this uh, global warming and other effects. Also, today there are special seeds designed for, are tailor-made for any kind of soil. So for instance, you can grow uh, corn in Antarctica, or you can grow the same corn in the Sahara Desert. It's just a different type of, uh, of genes, a different type of tailor-made um, biomolecular molecular, um, platform. This is being done today, already being uh, um, devised. The one thing which I, I saw, and I was floored, was a apple, you know, that was designed in Israel, which uh, has a very long shelf life, six months, without refrigeration. Just think, what does it do to shipment and storage? How much energy it saves? How much cheaper it is? And every, I talked to the scientists, and evidently, the, uh, the most difficult thing was to find the, the gene that gives it the same taste. The texture is the same, the size and the color is the same. To find the same taste was the most uh, difficult task, but they did it. Um, just a little anecdote, uh, how did it all come about? With some, um, some uh, scientists from Hebrew University about 20, 25 years ago, and uh, the guy who told me that was uh, uh, the former president, you know him, uh, the president of the Hebrew University, uh, before Ben Sasson now. Anyway, about 25 years ago, there were some executives from the Heinz Ketchup Corporation who came to Jerusalem, they, they saw and they, they spoke with their peers and the, some scientists over there, and they told them that the most expensive part of the process of making ketchup is separating the seeds of the tomato from the rest of the tomato. So then they began thinking, well, why don't we create seedless tomatoes? You know, we have today seedless tomatoes. Uh, and, and this was actually the, the, the archetype of this bioengineering in, in crops. And, um, and the university makes a lot of money out of the seedless tomatoes because the seedless tomatoes, you know, how do you grow the next generation of tomatoes if you don't have seeds? So you have to keep producing the seeds, whatever they do it. And each pound of these to seedless tomatoes cost $150,000. It's a great thing. But, uh, but it's still, you know, worthwhile for Heinz and other people to, to buy. So why am I saying that? Uh, because with these this technological innovations, and this goes with brain research and individualized medicine and... Uh, uh, Israel is, is there and continues to spin off uh, uh, technologies in all, all these areas which are relevant. I think this also gives us some stature politically. And if you, of course, uh, try to kind of uh, shy away from what's happening not far from here in this glass building of the United Nations, Israel uh, is not isolated. I mean, because there is a sea of change between multilateral uh, diplomacy, which we can see here in uh, New York or in Geneva or in, in any other international fora, and the, in, uh, and the bilateral negotiations. Because on bilateral, what matters is, you know, how, how a country can benefit from their relationship. And not only we have great relationship now with Africa or Asia, where we help them technologically and, and, and uh, technically, we have also these bilateral relations with, first and foremost, the United States, of course. You know, um, our bilateral trade uh, last year reached $25 billion. By the way, our bilateral trade with China is $9 billion. It went up from a billion only five years ago to nine today, and the trend is, is going up. In India, people like and, and seek Israeli technology. And, and, and it shows. Uh, and this is before the discovery offshore of this uh, natural gas and, um, uh, and and probably some oil also with this uh, new developments of deep, uh, deep sea drilling and techniques. Evidently, there is also a great amount of oil underneath that. You found it here. Uh, oil also is going to make a big uh, difference. Oil, I would say, is in my mind, is kind of the bridge between this um, technology or economic integration to the world of politics or disintegration of the, of the political world uh, because with oil 
becoming more abundant, and I believe you are going to be self-sufficient in a few years. Uh, we have in our research department in, 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 in Jerusalem, uh, and I saw it corroborated by, by other experts, that a barrel of oil may be $20 or less in, in, in 10 years or so. What would that mean? That would also change the geopolitics. Uh, I would say, if I look at the Arab world, they probably have reached their peak in the 70s or, or 80s, when their political cloud was really at, at, at the top, with the oil embargo, if you remember, after 73, and so on. So if I move now, so I say, so from this perspective of technological and economic integration, I think this is a, a, a good thing for Israel, it's a good thing for the United States, it, it's a good thing for the countries that can really uh, pull together resources, and I believe this is the only way to meet the challenges, the real challenges, I mean the physical existence challenges uh, of, of the future. And in that respect, Israel has a very good uh, 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 business card or a calling card to show. We, have, we are a great, uh, this is a great uh, asset that we have, not only bilaterally with countries that seek our scientific uh, cooperation, but also in the United Nations, aside from the politics. Uh, there are what they call the new agendas uh, in the UN, and again, there's food security and, and what have you, and Israeli experts are right there, heading uh, teams uh, to combat desertification and, and water conservation and, and, and things like that. By the way, on, on water also, water is, is going to be there. It's already probably more precious than oil, certainly in the Middle East. We are desalinating. We are the only country that desalinates uh, uh, in, on a massive scale uh, water, we plan to do more, and we will end up probably supplying water to the entire uh, Middle East. Hopefully, with nanotechnology, we will bring down the cost of desalination from 50 to 60 cents a cubic meter today. A cubic meter is a thousand gallons. If we do it, uh, bring it down to 20, 21 cents, that's going to be a real, real uh, a great thing, and uh, probably we, we can do that. So, with this lack of significance or lack of or, or lessening or diminishing weight of, of oil, we have to see what will that mean for us vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, Iran. I, I don't want to discuss too much Iran and the Palestinians because I want to leave something for Q&A. Um, and uh, I don't want to be here. You know better. Just to say Israel is good, Palestinians are bad. It's not uh, uh, good enough. It's a very complex issue. Uh, if I have to, uh, again, to, to, to give any kind of advice to, to the incoming uh, government is to look freshly and maybe think outside the box. One thing for sure, and also advice to, to, to our best allies, the, the American administration, and that is we must recalibrate our expectations because physically I do not see a final status agreement. The minimum the Palestinians demand do not meet the maximum Israel can give and keep our security and keep our uh, uh, existence uh, uh, safe. <coughs> so in order to look for a pie in the sky and just get disappointed and, and lose political credit one up time after another, like we have all been doing, certainly in the last 20 years since, since Oslo, I think we should recalibrate and maybe think of something which is not excellent, but it's good. You know, excellent or is the, the, the enemy of the, of the good. Let's think of something where we can have a, where we do have converging interests between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And I do not believe it's a zero-sum game. And I believe we, if we can think of some kind of a formula of exchange, of a fair exchange, of uh, let's say, uh, uh, some sovereignty and independence to the Palestinians without uh, the final contours of, of, of the territories and security and recognition to Israel, there's something we can work with. And without final borders. Israel does not have final borders now for, for the last uh, 65 years. Uh, we may think maybe to go back to the roadmap. And, you know, the, 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 the phase, the, you know, the three phases, and uh, we can certainly think of a the second phase and, and try to create it for a long term kind of an interim uh, um, interim uh, a solution which again will give Israel its security and recognition so it will kind of uh, suggest for 
once we have the final status of finality of claims and finality of, uh, of the conflict, with desire of some sovereignty and independence, uh, dignity, if you will, uh, for the Palestinians. This can be done. Now, who are the Palestinians? Is it uh, Abu Mazen? Is it uh, uh, Hamas? I believe that the rate we're going, not by design, but by default, we may see not one Palestinian state, but two of them. But this is not up to us. It's, it's for them to sort out their own affairs. Uh, there are these new talks about negotiations right now in Cairo between the Hamas and, and the Fatah. Uh, we don't have a say on that, except that if, if negotiations or if uh, any reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah is on Hamas terms, this slams shut the door for any type of hope uh, for the future. If it's on Fatah or others, maybe we have a chance. Um, Hamas has refused the international community um, demands uh, or conditions. Uh, and we also said we could respect them as a legitimate interlocutor if they renounce and stop terrorism, if they recognize Israel, and if they abide by former agreements between us and the Palestinians. Right now, there is no chance that they are agreeing to that. So, in conclusion, many changes, the two major changes, I think, uh, have more promises than challenges, certainly for Israel and, and the United States and the like-minded countries. With the Palestinians, I would say we need to think of, of management of the conflict and reduce uh, tensions uh, where it is possible. And I believe if we do have an interim agreement, on that, on that we can build trust, confidence, economic cooperation, uh, and then maybe reasons will prevail and we can think uh, with less acrimony uh, on, on political solutions. And uh, the Middle East itself, again, we will have to brace for many, many changes. Some are better than others, but um, it, it is quite an irony. Uh, if you recall after 48, when Israel was re-established and the Arabs lost the war, and since then, after every war, they said, not to worry, time uh, uh, works for us. We benefit from time. The Jewish entity will implode with time. 65 years later, we are an OECD country. We have one of the best economies uh, of the world, technological, uh, scientific uh, power. Uh, we can defend ourselves by ourselves and we'll continue to, to that's the most important thing for us to, to continue and, and, and uphold. And the Arab world is imploding. So the last thing I want to say, it's, it's not a matter of, of time. Time doesn't work for anybody, except those who use it well. And I can't say that we have used it in the most perfect way, but I think we used it better than our adversaries. And as long as we do this, as long as we will continue to work on, well, defending ourselves, of course, it's a must. But if we continue to do this, but with a, a commensurate amount of of investments in development, in building the country, I think we will be all right. And by building the country, it's not just physically building the country, also morally and socially. On that, I think we're lagging. You know, the gaps are growing, and uh, we need to think of a different framework um, of more universal uh, burden sharing, if you know what I mean, with a universal draft, uh, maybe political reform. but. That's what governments are for, to, to work the problems. And you cannot do it all in, in one day. We're still a young uh, a, a country. But I'm, again, very optimistic. And the last thing I want to say is thank you. First of all, Mort, thank you. And thank each and every one of you for being such a, you know, the, the best brothers uh, or sisters that uh, we could have. And uh, really uh, watching and having your back. And I don't think Israel would be where it is today without the great support we have from the United States, we are natural allies. For us, it's of course critical. I believe it's also very vital and important for the United States. I think both of us get a lot from this alliance and relationship, and I have no reason to doubt that this will continue. And I believe uh, with the new administration, and uh, again, in the news, I hear all kinds of speculations. I have no doubt that the great relationship will continue because 
not only we know each other, not only it is the shared values, it is also very necessary for our own welfare and well-being and security. So uh, thank you very much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.